was the world made for man? I seem to be the only scientist and theologian still remaining to be heard from on this important matter of whether the world was made for man or not. I feel that it is time for me to speak. I stand almost with the others. They believe the world was made for man. I believe it likely that it was made for man. They think there is proof, astronomical mainly, uh, that it was made for man. I think there is evidence only, not proof, that it was made for him. It is too early yet uh, to arrange the verdict. The returns are not all in. When they are all in, I think they will show that the world was made for man. But we must not hurry. We must patiently wait till they are all in. Now, as far as we have got, astronomy is on our side. Mr. Wallace has clearly shown this. He has clearly shown two things, that the world was made for man and that the universe was made for the world, uh, to steady it, you know. The astronomy part is settled and cannot be challenged. We come now to the geological part. This is the one where the evidence is not all in. Yet, it is coming in, hourly, daily, coming in all the time, uh, but naturally it comes with geological carefulness and deliberation, and we must not be impatient, we must not get excited, we must be calm and wait. To lose our tranquility will not hurry geology. Nothing hurries geology. It takes a long time to prepare a world for man. Such a thing is not done in a day. Some of the great scientists, carefully ciphering the evidences furnished by geology, have arrived at the conviction that our world is prodigiously old, and they may be right. Uh, but Lord Kelvin is not of their opinion. He takes a cautious, conservative view in order to be on the safe side and feels sure it is not so old as they think. As Lord Kelvin is the highest authority in science now living, I think we must yield to him and accept his view. He does not concede that the world is more than a hundred million years old. He believes it is that old but not older. Lyle believed that our race was introduced into the world 31,000 years ago. Spencer makes it 32,000. Lord Kelvin agrees with Spencer. Very well. According to these figures, it took 99,968,000 years to prepare the world for man. Impatient as the Creator doubtless was to see him and admire him. But a large enterprise like this has to be conducted warily, painstakingly, logically. It was foreseen that man would have to have the oyster. Therefore, the first preparation was made for the oyster. Very well. You cannot make an oyster out of whole cloth. You must make the oyster's ancestors first. This is not done in a day. You must make a vast variety of invertebrates to start with. A belemnites, trilobites, jebusites, amaculites, and that sort of fry, and put them to soak in a primary sea and wait and see what will happen. Some will be a disappointment. The Belamites, the Ammonites and such, they will be failures. They will die out 
and become extinct in the course of the 19 million years covered by the experiment. But all is not lost, for the amalgites will fetch the home stake, and they will develop gradually into encronites and stalactites and blatherskites, and one thing and another as the mighty ages creep on, and the Archaean and the Cambrian periods pile their lofty crags in the primordial seas, and at last the first grand stage in the preparation of the world for man stands completed. The oyster is done. An oyster has hardly any more reason and power than a scientist has, and so it is reasonably certain that this one jumped to the conclusion that the nineteen million years was a preparation for him. But that would be just like an oyster, which is the most conceited animal there is, except man. And anyway, uh, this one could not know at that early date that he was only an incident in a scheme, and there was some more to the scheme yet. The oyster being achieved, the next thing to be arranged for in the preparation of the world for man was fish. Fish and coal to fry it with. So the old Silurian seas were opened up to breed the fish in, and at the same time the great work of building old red sandstone mountains 80,000 feet high to cold storage their fossils in was begun. This latter was quite indispensable, for there would be no end of failures again, no end of extinctions, millions of them and it would be cheaper and less trouble to can them in the rocks than keep tally of them in a book. One does not build the coal beds and 80,000 feet of perpendicular old red sandstone in a brief time. No, it took 20 million years. In the first place, a coal bed is a slow and troublesome and tiresome thing to construct. You have to grow prodigious forests of tree ferns and reeds and calamites and such things in a marshy region. Then you have to sink them under out of sight and let them rot. Then you have to turn the streams on them so as to bury them under several feet of sediment. And the sediment must have time to harden and turn to rock. Next you must grow another forest on top, then sink it and put on another layer of sediment and harden it, then more forest and more rock, layer upon layer, three miles deep. Ah, indeed, it is a sickeningly slow job to build a coal measure and do it right. So the millions of years drag on, and meantime the fish culture is lazing along and frazzling out in a way to make a person tired. You have developed ten thousand kinds of fishes from the oyster, and come to look, you have raised nothing but fossils, nothing but extinctions. There is nothing left alive and progressive but a ganoid or two and perhaps half a dozen asteroids. Even the cat wouldn't eat such. Still, it is no great matter. Uh, there is plenty of time yet, and they will develop into something tasty before man is ready for them. Even a ganoid uh, can be depended on for that, uh, when he is not going to be called on for sixty million years. The Paleozoic time limit having now been reached, it was necessary to begin the next stage in the preparation of the world for man by opening up the Mesozoic age and instituting some reptiles. For man would need reptiles, not to eat, but to develop himself from. This being the most important detail of the scheme, a spacious liberality of time was set apart for it. Thirty million years. What wonders followed!
From the remaining ganoids and asteroids and alkaloids were developed by a slow and steady and painstaking culture, those stupendous saurians that used to prowl about the steamy world in those remote ages, with their snaky heads reared forty feet in the air and sixty feet of body and tail, racing and thrashing after. All gone now, alas, all extinct, except the little handful of Arkansorians left stranded and lonely with us here upon this far-flung verge and fringe of time. Yes, it took thirty million years and twenty million reptiles to get one that would stick long enough to develop into something else and let the scheme proceed to the next step. Then the pterodactyl burst upon the world in all his impressive solemnity and grandeur, and all nature recognized that the Cainozoic threshold was crossed and a new period open for business, a new stage begun in the preparation of the globe for man. It may be that the pterodactyl thought the thirty million years had been intended as a preparation for himself, for there was nothing too foolish for a pterodactyl to imagine. But he was in error. The preparation was for man. Oh, without doubt, the pterodactyl attracted great attention, for even the least observant could see that there was the makings of a bird in him. And so it turned out. Also, the makings of a mammal in time. From this time onward for nearly another thirty million years the preparation moved briskly. From the pterodactyl was developed the bird. From the bird the kangaroo, from the kangaroo, the other marsupials, uh, from these the mastodon, the megatherium, the giant sloth, and the Irish elk, and all that crowd that you can make useful and instructive fossils out of. Then came the first great ice sheet, and they all retreated before it, and crossed over the bridge at Bering Strait, and wandered around over Europe and Asia, and died, all except a few, to carry on the preparation with. Six glacial periods, with two million years between periods, chased these poor orphans up and down and about the earth, from weather to weather, from tropic swelter at the poles to arctic frosts at the equator, and back again, and to and fro, they never knowing what kind of weather was going to turn up next. And if they ever settled down anywhere, the whole continent suddenly sank under them without the least notice, and they had to trade places with the fishes and scramble off to where the seas had been, and scarcely a dry rag on them. And when there was nothing else doing... A volcano would let go and fire them out from wherever they had located. They led this unsettled and irritating life for twenty-five million years, half the time afloat, half the time aground, and always wondering what it was all for. They never suspecting, of course, that it was a preparation for man and had to be done just so or it wouldn't be any proper and harmonious place for him when he arrived. And at last came the monkey, and anybody could see that man wasn't far off now. And in truth, that was so. The monkey went on developing for close upon five million years, and then turned into a man, uh, to all appearances. Such is the history of it. Man has been here thirty-two thousand years. That it took a hundred million years to prepare the world for him is proof that that is what it was done for. I suppose it is. I don't know. 
If the Eiffel Tower were now representing the world's age, the skin of paint on the pinnacle knob at its summit would represent man's share of that age. And anybody would perceive that that skin was what the tower was built for. I reckon they would. I don't know.